and welcome. The countdown has begun for Budget 2024. Next week, the first budget of the Narendra Modi-led NDA 3.0 will be unveiled. It's a budget which comes against the backdrop of a general election that didn't quite go the way of Prime Minister Modi and the BJP. Many believe a key factor for that was jobs, or should we say, rather the lack of them. A sense that the Modi government is still not been able to provide enough jobs for India's vast youth population. What can the Modi government, or indeed any government, do to address the job challenge as we enter Budget Week? That's going to be the big focus on our special roundtable, the job challenge. Thousands turn up for a walk-in interview for 2,000 jobs in Mumbai. Job hunters land in stampede-like situation in Baruch. RBI claims 4.6 crore jobs were created last year. Is report ke anusar, bite teen char saalo mein, desh mein lagbhag 8 crore nae rojgaar mile hai. Opposition claims unemployment is at its highest in 45 years. Note van GST COVID resulted in a loss of 11.3 lakh crore to, the, to India's economy and extinguished 1.6 crore informal sector jobs. The 2.7 lakh central PSU jobs have been lost under Mr. Modi. States scramble to douse youth anger. Maharashtra announces stipend scheme for youth. Karnataka plans quota for Kannadigas. It's country's biggest challenge. The Great Indian Job Hunt. What can the Modi government then do to address the job crisis as we enter Budget Week? That's going to be the big focus of this budget roundtable that we have on the news today. Joining us now are Manish Sabarwal, Vice Chairman, Team Lee Services. Dr. Arun Kumar, Senior Economist, who's been writing extensively on this. Shankar Ayer, Political Economy Analyst and Author. Anshul Avjit, Congress Spokesperson. And uh, Sanju Varma, BJP's National Spokesperson. I appreciate all of you joining us. I'm going to raise the big questions once again. Job creation? Is that India's biggest challenge now, or the Modi government's challenge in Budget Week? How can the country create more jobs? How can the government revive the informal sector in particular? Is an urban job guarantee scheme needed? Is income stagnation really the real problem along with creating quality jobs? Manish Sabarwal and Professor Kumar and Shankar are here as the experts in a way on our panel. Let's come to each of you one by one because we've had Reserve Bank of India earlier this month suggesting there's been a bump in employment in the last five years. And we've had a city group report suggesting that even with 7% employment, 7% uh, growth rate, India will struggle to create more jobs. Where does the truth lie? Why don't you start, Manish? Yeah, I mean, I think it's both both sides are right. India's problem has never been unemployment. Unemployment is 4 to 9% since 1947. Our problem is employed poverty. I think until we make peace with this, that uh, you know, unemployment is a mathematical concept, and it's true that four to nine percent because of two shock absorbers: agricultural employment and informal employment. Now, the question really is: is what do you do about employed poverty? Is you raise productivity of five things. You raise productivity of our states, you raise productivity of our sectors, you raise productivity of our firms, and you raise productivity of our individuals. So my sense is that um, I think when if you diagnose the problem as unemployment, you'll throw money from helicopters, you'll mandate a three-day work week, you'll take away shovels and give them spoons. But we have oversold fiscal and monetary policy as a solution to jobs. So I would submit that we have to be stay the course on raising the productivity through formalization, urbanization, and just making life easy for employers. You know, this bird's eye view of, of employers, the daily life of employers, you know, on the regulatory cholesterol that we face is probably the most important way to raise high paying jobs. Mm -hmm. If the debate is about jobs, we have enough jobs. But what the question is, how will we do high paying jobs? Okay. 
Uh, interesting the way you're putting it there. Uh, remove the regulatory cholesterol, make it easier in a way to employ. The ease of doing business must also involve the ease of giving people employment. Am I correct in a way from what you're saying? Absolutely. I mean, there, are, there is no way to comply with 100% of India's labor laws without violating 10% of them. There are 17 definitions of wages. There are 22 definitions of workers. So I think the process of ease of doing business, which began, you know, Jan Vishwas Bill 1.0 was a wonderful innovation in terms of decriminalization. But Jan Vishwas 2.0 needs to remove out of the 25,000 ways an employer can go to jail, 60% of them are with states, but 10,000... The central government now in Jan Vishwas 2 is looking to remove it. I hope that it in the Jan Vishwas 1, only 100 of them were removed. But now in Jan Vishwas 2, you know, there's no reason to have 10,000 ways to go to jail. Of course, if somebody steals provident fund, you should put them in jail. But if somebody doesn't make a compliance, if somebody doesn't put Chuna in the bathroom, all this, you know, stuff has to go because foreign investors and small companies you know big companies like us have 120 guys in regulatory affairs we'll manage but mm. for smaller guys and foreign investors the the regulatory cholesterol is a flick of pen reform right most people to budgets will propose fiscal reform we don't have fiscal space they'll pursue institutional reforms which will take time but the flick of re pen reform could be jan vishwas too could be adding reg tech to digital public infrastructure should getting ahead with universal enterprise number so these plumbing reforms which matter the worm's eye view of an employer is really what policy can do i think interesting the way you're putting it there manish let's come to dr arun kumar who i'm sure has a very different point of view because you've been writing away about how the informal sector you believe has been virtually destroyed in the last decade and that has led you believe fundamentally to the employment crisis at the bottom of the pyramid you've heard what manish sabarwal said he believes there should be more formalization of the economy your response uh, you know, uh, Rajdeep, the problem is with the data. <clears throat> you mentioned the RBI report. The RBI report is a CLEMS report. It is capital, labor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that it doesn't give independent data. It uses the government's data from labor you know, force data and the, from the ASUS data. So it's not an independent report. It is being projected as if the RBI is giving the data. RBI is simply using that data. Now, the point is that, you know, this is the kind of confusion that is being created, that RBI is also supporting the government's claim. Now, why does the Citibank differ? The Citibank differs because it is using CMIE data. It is not using the data that the government puts out to the PLFS and the ASUAS data, right? So the, the definition of unemployment and employment differs between the CMIE and between the government data. The government data says that if you're working, even if you're not getting a wage, then you are counted as a worker and employed. The CMI data uses the ILO definition, where if you're not getting a wage in the market, then you're not counted as employed. So what it effectively means is that the unorganized sector, which is 94% of the employment, that is where actually the unemployment is. And that will not go away by formalization. The more you formalize the technology that is used in the formal sector, the organized sector, is so highly automated. And with the use of artificial intelligence, it is actually going to be even less uh, employment generating. So in a sense, the more you have the organized sector uh, in terms of GDP, the more you have the mechanization and the automation, the more problem of employment generation you'll have. But even isn't that, isn't that if I may ask you for a moment, Professor Kumar, isn't that inevitable? I mean... At some level, the automation, the fact that informal, a, for, a certain formalization will have to take place is inevitable in a country like India, isn't it? I know that the informal sector remains vast and provides huge amounts of jobs at the bottom of the pyramid. But eventually, governments will look to formalize, surely, as, as growth rates pick up. No, it depends on what our priorities are. Uh, do we prioritize human beings and their employment compared to what the producers in the organized sector want? Do we prioritize technology over people? What is it that is our priority in the nation where, you know, a large number of youth and the un unemployment is concentrated in educated youth? According to the ILO, 84% of the unemployment is in the educated youth. You saw recently how, you know, in the Air India, there was a crush because, you know, thousands of people came for a few hundred jobs. 
you saw for instance the police uh, uh, you know uh, uh, exam in up where for 60000 jobs 46 lakh people applied you saw earlier in the railways for 35000 non technical jobs 1.2 crore people applied for the uh, earlier the peons job of 360 jobs uh, 23 lakh people applied of which 380 were phd's they, you know, there were 2 lakh btech mtech bcom mcom applying for these jobs so there is a huge problem of unemployment amongst the women because the labor force participation rate there is very low it is amongst the educated youth and this is going to create a huge social problem that's why in the elections we saw there was a huge anger. So the question is, what is the nation's priority? Are we going to prioritize employment over mm -hmm. other things, or are we going to prioritize organized sector? Because you see, organized I... sector uh, gets 80 percent of the investment, mm -hmm. but hardly generates any jobs. It is the unorganized sector, whether in agriculture and in the micro sector, they will generate jobs. I think. So I think. I think your. This is the this is the nub of the debate. I'll get Manish to respond in a moment. But Shankar Ayer, why don't you give us a sense? You've heard two viewpoints, which perhaps uh, represent two uh, sides of the spectrum. Manish Sabarwal saying you need to formalize the economy. You need to remove some of the reg regulatory cholesterol that exists. And you've got Professor Arun Kumar who says, look, the priority has been has to be to strengthen in a way uh, the informal sector, micro enterprises, because they are the high employment generators. Your response. Well, you know, the Cambridge economist Joan Robinson once said anything and everything that you say about India, the opposite is equally true. So we live in those ages. Basically, what we are looking at is an issue that has haunted India for decades. And for, issue, for decades, India has been solving yesterday's problems. Mm -hmm. Without growth, you will only redistribute poverty. We saw that in Karnataka. You can't create more jobs, so you reallocate the options, the percentages that's happening. Let's look at it. What can be done? I mean, how are jobs created? When you propel growth, you solve some of the problems of the country or the nation or the economy. Let me give you just two instances. Maybe this will make things clear for you and the audience. India has a food price inflation problem. Mm -hmm. One of the solutions is to expand food processing. The food processing ministry was formed in 1988. India wastes something to the extent of 80,000 crores of standing crops, wastage, rotting, whatever you call it. Only 10% of India's food is processed. Food processing is in the at the intersection of urban and rural economy, it can absorb low skill, no skill people. Are we pushing that? Now, yes, this has to be done by the states. And this government has, uh, has been in power in around 15 states uh, for over 10 years. The same story with Congress previously. So state government. So what we are doing normally is that we give a free pass to the state governments on most uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Manish spoke about regulatory cholesterol. A large part of it is in the state government. Let me give you another example. India has around 4,000 census towns, which are neither villages nor towns. Mm -hmm. Urbanization is a known force multiplier for growth. In 2015, Venkaya Naidu, as urban development minister, wrote to all the state governments asking them to convert these uh, census towns into municipalities. Each of these census towns would have created around 100 jobs, would have created indirect jobs, would have led to growth as urbanization drives growth. Have we seen that happening? No. Why? Because state governments don't want to do that. The question, I mean, the, you know, I mean, that... you know, India is one of those economies where you are constantly staring at the problem and the solution simultaneously. You know, that's interesting the way you're again putting it there, uh, Shankar. I'll, I'll get you to look at this center state issue again because state governments say it is the center which has been uh, restrictive. We can, we can discuss that, uh, you know, whether the center takes the responsibility of the states. I'll get the two politicians. It's good to have politicians listening first uh, to others and get them to respond now. You, Anshul Abhijit, first because uh, it's the opposition which has been constantly raising this issue that the Modi government has failed on the jobs front. But if I look at certain Congress governments, for example, you were in power in Rajasthan. 
between 2018 and 23. When I look at the numbers of Rajasthan on employment, they are uh, uh, they were among the worst performing states in providing new jobs. So it's not as if the Congress has come up with some magical solution for the job crisis. Your guarantee program, as we are seeing in Karnataka, is putting a lot of pressure on the budgetary, uh, on the Karnataka budget, on their fiscal uh, situation. So. Where is the solution? It's very easy to blame who is in power, saying you haven't created jobs. But do you have a model in place that would actually provide jobs, productive jobs, quality employment? You know, Rajdeep, it wasn't the Rajasthan government or the Karnataka government that had demonetization, something that completely threw the economy under the bus. It destroyed it. It wasn't the Karnataka government that the GST and the fallout of that which destroyed the, the MSME sector. Uh, the MSME sector is not a monolith. You know, there are six crores, uh, 6.3 crore MSMEs, which are micro MSMEs, and almost all of them have got flattened because of the policies of the central government, right? We can't underestimate that. In fact, it can't be enough can be said about it. I, I would say that the fact that we are having this debate 10 years after the Modi government that what about um, unemployment, manufacturing is dead. For years I've been hearing there are green shoots in the economy, I can't see them. Every time I hear green shoots, nothing green can ever be seen. This is a scathing, this debate itself is a scathing indictment of the policies of the Modi government or Modi economics. And whatever I say or whatever the rebuttal might be, that is what this debate is all about. It's there in the open. And whatever facts and figures tell you, I mean, data, we are questioning data. Of course, we are, because there's a contradiction between even what the RBI says uh, and what uh, the ILO has said about gro uh, job growth. I mean, you've not even had a national census yet. You cannot even have a national census, and therefore the data that is stemming is absolutely inaccurate. So how can you trust the government and anything? Now, it's not just demonetization. It is not just the rollout of the GST, which completely destroyed MSMEs. It was during the COVID years where, um, you know, the... the the amount of GDP as a fiscal stimulus was barely 1 or 2%. Other countries had 10%. You know, America went Keynesian in that sense. So it gave so much of stimulus, and you had a very strong labor market. I mean, it is said now that a strong labor market means a strong economy. And look at that in America. I mean, a brutally capitalist country going away in the, in the way the fiscal uh, uh, stimulus went. We didn't do that. We have consistently, from all our policies, yeah, but the jury is out whether the make in India, the jury is India, out on that. Whether, you know, countries have had differing experiences during COVID years of using large fiscal stimuli. Uh, there are uh, challenges they faced on the inflation front. India is a country which has multiple challenges. So I think you know, but you raised, you flagged off a point which I think Sanju Verma needs to respond, and then I'll come to my guests, uh, the other guests again, because Sanju Verma. The truth of the matter is the government can't, you know, the government will now use these RBI numbers to say, look, the RBI says 8 crore jobs have been created. There are others who give very differing numbers. One can only go by anecdotal evidence, the images that we've seen in the last few weeks, thousands of people applying for a few hundred jobs across this country. Uh, there is a crisis. Why not accept that? It's not just confined to your government. It would have... Most governments across the country, state and centre, are facing a huge challenge. Is there an acceptance of that? Because if you don't accept the crisis in itself, then how are you going to solve it? Rajdeep, I heard your question. It's a sensible debate you're having with some uh, very well-known names on your panel. You use the term anecdotal evidence. Forget about what Citibank says. Forget even what RBI says. Forget about what JP Morgan says or Deutsche Bank says. I will tell you what the World Bank says. And you have to listen to this very carefully. Your audience will, uh, you know, completely... Uh, you know, uh, realize what I'm trying to uh, put forth here. The World Bank says, as a rule of thumb, every $10 million investment leads to 600 jobs, which means every $100 million investment leads to 6,000 jobs, every $1 billion investment leads to 60,000 jobs, every $10 billion investment leads to 6 lakh jobs, and every $100 billion investment leads to 60 lakh jobs. These are rule of thumb numbers given by World Bank. Now, let us just use this data and, you know, try and make sense of it. What is the size of planned investments in India's infrastructure space? It is $1.4 trillion, which means, by World Bank's logic, 
that should have created in India 8.4 crore jobs. What is the size of India's automotive industry? It is $122 billion, which means it should have created in India 74 lakh jobs. What is the size of the construction and logistics space in India? In terms of investments, it is $320 billion, which means it should have created 1.94 crore jobs. And what is the size of the retail industry in India? It is again $1.4 trillion, leading to creation of 8.4 crore jobs. And last but not the least, what is the size of civil aviation, travel and tourism industry? The size is $240 billion, which means that has led to the creation of 1.46 crore jobs. Now, why did I give out this data? This is to tell you, as somebody on the panel very rightly said, the problem in India or in any major developing economy which is growing at 8% plus mm -hmm. is never employment. It is employability. And I think where the Narendra Modi government needs to be given huge amount of credit is the fact that it has not merely focused on employment, it has focused on employability. How? It has focused no, no, give me on one example. creation of livelihoods. Give me one example how they've done, how they've focused on employability and then I'll move on to my next guest. Give me one example. I'm coming to that. Rajdeep, you know, uh, we are having a great debate. You asked me a question. Now listen to this very carefully because the Congress spokesperson made many points and nothing was rebutted by you. Ma'am. I will give you the biggest example. I'm giving you the example. Let's yeah. not now uh, interject each other. I will give you not one example, Rajdeep Sardesai. I will give you a couple of examples. First and foremost, don't forget, prior to Narendra Modi coming to power in 2014, there were just 3,000 startups. Today, Rajdeep Sardesai, there are more than 130,000 startups. Today, Rajdeep Sardesai, there are more than 111 unicorns. And if I have to go back to my past example, when you cross a billion dollars in market cap, you become a unicorn, mm -hmm. which means every billion dollar market cap unicorn has the ability to create at least 60,000 jobs. But my last point is this to Anshul. He made, because I have to rebut this, he made some points about demonetization and one of your panelists spoke about the need for formalization. I want to ask you, Rajdeep, you're having a sensible debate. Demonetization happened, uh, you know, in 2016. Now you tell me what was the size of India's informal economy prior to, no prior to November 2016? Take a wild guess since you're hosting this debate. Very humbly, I ask you. No, no, I'm going to Professor, one minute. I have the expert the on this subject. No, no, one minute, ma'am. No, 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 one no, minute. Let me finish. Let me finish. You have 30 seconds. Take 10 seconds. Yes. The size of India's informal economy prior to November 2016 was 40%. And today, the size of India's informal economy is down to between 15 to 20%, point number one and point number two. Let everybody hear, hear this. P. Chidambaram on the floor of the parliament said that digital India is never going to be a pleasant reality. And Mr. Uh, Ayer, you know, he's a prolific columnist. I'm sure he will endorse this. Today, every single month, let your audience know, not every single year, every single month, digital transaction in India, the value is 20 lakh crore, which is akin to 6.4% of India's GDP. And if you are telling me, Rajdeep, you asked me, for example, 10 seconds more. I have 10 seconds more. This is the same India where we sell 20 lakh motorcycles every month. This is the same India where we sell 5 lakh scooters every month. This is the same India where we sell 1 lakh tractors every month. This is the same India where Maruti Suzuki sells 5 cars every minute. And this is the same India which is seeing which, a 28% growth in credit card loans let, and a 18% growth in personal you, loans. You've that thrown these figures at me in the past the as well. Ma'am. The that truth of the matter is the that it is comes stagnant. back. It comes back to the pro that the government, uh, as you can hear, Dr. Arun Kumar says that look, we've got the situation under control. The figures which are thrown on digital economy, for example, the figures which are thrown on startups are true. These are there has been a multiple growth in all these areas. The question that uh, just a minute, ma'am. Now, Professor Kumar, the informal challenge, yes. the fact that we've actually. Re uh, the informal sector's share of the total economy has come down. Is that a good sign or bad sign? Sanju Verma seems to indicate that this formalization is a positive sign. You, when you are writing, seen it as very different and believe that's fundamentally part of the problem for the job crisis. Am I correct? 
Yes. So, you know, uh, what's happened is since demonetization, the organized sector is growing at the expense of the unorganized sector. And data for that is available from the trade sector, which is the second biggest employer, where, you know, the, the e-commerce is growing at 20, 30 percent, whereas the neighborhood stores are declining. You have data coming from FMCG sector, from textile sector, leather goods sector, uh, you know, pressure cooker sector, etc., showing that how the organized sector is growing at the expense of the unorganized sector. So actually, the, the problem is that organized sector employs very few people. It's the unorganized sector that employs most of the people. So the unorganized sector is declining. Obviously, you'll have a problem of employment. And this is where the argument that growth will create jobs by itself is not adequate. It actually depends on what kind of technology and which sectors you have growth coming from. If the growth is coming largely from the organized sector, then you'll have very few jobs created. If the growth comes from the unorganized sector, that is from the micro sector, from agriculture sector, then you'll have much more so employment So give me generation. an example, Professor, of what you would have suggested. What, when you say that there is not enough growth being created in the unorganized sector, agriculture sector, give me an example of something that you would do as a policy intervention that you believe would actually kickstart growth in these critical areas. Yeah, so what I would what do the is government shift hasn't the done. budget. Yeah, I, I shift the budget's focus from capital intensive to labor intensive areas. You know, the 11.11 lakh crore is largely going into capital intensive sectors, whereas, you know, there have been in real terms cuts in education, in health, where there'd be a lot of employment generation, rural employment guarantee scheme has been curtailed, rural development has been curtailed. That's where you can generate employment. The micro sector, what does it require? Micro sector requires technology. It requires, uh, uh, you know, capital. It requires marketing. So therefore, you can create cooperatives and you can help them to grow and if you reform the gst then the disadvantage of the unorganized sector suffers would also go away so i'd reform gst and make it simply a last point tax which it is already a last point tax but i'd collect it only at the last point and i'd reduce the amount of uh, uh, gst on uh, but are you, you know, saying are items. you saying professor kumar the large investment that the modi government has put for in the infrastructure sector for example is not creating jobs are you telling me yes. that jobs are not being created that's right. Jobs, very few jobs are created. For instance, if you saw a road construction project in the 1980s, there'd be hundreds of people. Now with big bulldozers, big cranes, etc., you see hardly 10 people working. So you won't uh, create much job in the, you know, the highway projects, in the railway freight corridor project, or in the power project, where bulk of the investment, the 11.11 lakh crore is going. And where you have cuts are in the rural employment guarantee scheme, etc., where employment should be generated. So there's a need to reprioritize, and the organized sector would grow. Because if the demand increases in the unorganized sector, the, the demand would increase for the organized sector. Organized sector has enough capital to invest. So that organized sector doesn't need help. It is the unorganized sector that needs help. Okay. And that's why you'll have employment generation. You know, uh, Manish Sabarwal, you kick-started the debate by saying you need to formalize the, uh, the economy. Here you've got Professor uh, Kumar, who gives the different perspective, which virtually suggests that you need to reprioritize. At the end of the day, in a country like India, where large swathes of people have uh, worked in the informal sector with limited skills, either you uh, upgrade skill levels or you create incentivized people to expand the informal sector. I mean, how long are we going to depend on jobs like Raju and Chotu or in farm employment? I mean, you know, there was a Russian economist in 1920. He convinced Nehru that small farms are viable because you don't have to pay your wife a salary, your kids a salary, and you don't have to pay rent. He called it the theory of self-exploitation. You know, informality is a sense of humor about the rule of law in non-farm employment. And in farm employment, it's self-exploitation. So if India wants to really raise our per capita income, you know, we're fifth in total GDP, we're 135th in per capita, we have to formalize, we have to raise the productivity of our enterprises. You know, somebody mentioned 63 million enterprises, 12 million of them don't have an office, 12 million work from home. Only 1 million pay provident fund. There are only 25,000 companies in India with a paid up capital of more than 10 crores. So I think this, you know, this romanticism of the informal sector, it basically exploits its workers, doesn't give them living wages. Let's recognize that it was very important to our past, but that was built on self-exploitation or low aspirations. The aspirations of what were jobs good enough for our grandparents, our parents are no longer acceptable to our youth. They expect to work in 
in the formal sector, they expect to have a letter of employment and they expect to work for employers who have the productivity to pay them higher wages. So I think if we stay the course, mm -hmm. what the budget can do is please give us macroeconomic stability. You know, if fiscal deficits could make countries rich, then no country would bother being poor. And please make the daily life of employers easier. We are on track to cross China and we have an ally, you know, Xi Jinping, I hope he doesn't get a fourth term. I hope he gets a life term because there are 40 factory refugees trying to run away from China and India is ready for them. And I think in the next few years, our manufacturing employment is also all set to rise. Shankar Iyer, once again, coming to you to, to try and find some, some middle path, if there is one, between what I see as two sort of contradictory views, Mani Sabarwal suggesting you need to formalize, provide people productive quality employment above all else. You've got Professor Arun Kumar saying, recognize the reality that exists on the ground. People are struggling in the informal sector for some kind of government support. All advanced economies are actually heterogeneous economies. I mean, the in the United States, if you see small home offices are of a larger number than large uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, Germany, it is the medium sector, the MSMEs, which sort of rule. So you cannot sort of propel the idea of one or the other. We will need to be heterogeneous in our approach to uh, how we build this economy. The principal point that we need to look at is what are the problems we are solving? So here's the thing. There are about 3 million jobs vacant in uh, state governments. What are they about? They're about education. They're about health care. They're about police personnel. Are we going to fill that or do we think this is in excess? The government should come out and make that statement. There are about a million jobs vacant in the central government. Are they in excess or are they going to be filled? If they are not being filled, why are they not being filled? So the first uh, person uh, principle is those jobs that are there, let's figure out whether they need to be there or they need to be chucked out. Okay. The second part is what are the problems that India faces? India faces problems in skills. It faces problems in education. It faces problems in healthcare. It faces pro problems in delivery of water services. We have gated communities. India needs new habitats. We spoke about smart cities 10 years back. Uh, the only thing I saw was a dumb policy. So essentially, we need to fix the problems. Once you fix, start fixing the problems, you will create the jobs that uh, need to be created. Mm -hmm. I want to place one part. I mean, India's governments have traditionally been pro size. So we should not get into the argument of volume versus value. Value doesn't lead to volume of employment. Okay, so but value is important to fund development. So let's not get into these binaries. India's tax policies mm -hmm. are, are advantages to large size and disadvantages to small size. I'll give you a simple. This government talks about employment generators, people who create employment. What is the GST on a self-employed person? 18%. Where is the scope for that person to get it offset in any expense? What is the GST on basic educational services? These are the things that if you, if you fix, and of course the 66,000 compliances that Manish sort of will can detail to you. I mean, you know, this is being written about. So it takes about 1,400 days to close an enterprise and about 400 days to start an enterprise. This is completely ridiculous. So but these are the small a, things you know, that, that need to be done. You know, and, you, I remember, Shankar, you writing about this a decade ago. The problem is many of these problems have festered for way too long. Well, I know uh, my first book, Accidental India, somebody asked me, why is India so special? I said, because we stare at the problem and the solution simultaneously until <laughs> such time that there is a crisis. So I hope that's not where we are. I mean, we are in that place in water, water management. What is the kind of... Uh, Hydrology but, that we want to have. I mean, if suppose government of India uh, in its infrastructure funding creates funding for desalination, desalination plants for re water recycling plants, these will create jobs. Okay. Uh, it should also the... expand the rooftop solar because that's a huge potential. I mean, you sure, know, it's, the, it's the, you know those, are, those are clearly areas you can look at solar, you can look at renewables. Uh, you can, of course, as the government 
insist step up infrastructure but anshul abjit let's come up with your model you see the opposition needs to tell me today what is that model we've heard from a couple of our guests that state governments also need to participate in in raising employment generation this is not just a problem located in delhi you seem to suggest that demonetization transform uh, you know uh, change things for the worse uh, there will be those who will say it propelled the digital economy that's another debate the real debate at the moment is does anyone have a model a growth centric model that also provides productive employment that's the challenge that governments are facing not just in india but across the world not just in delhi but in state capitals as well so what so is the, the model is... what would the model be if the opposition was in power today so the challenge now has even become more massive because of the the really uh, uh, you know the kind of deviant policies of this government right from make in india to start in india to the to the pli scheme which is which which uh, actually uh, the uh, chief economic advisor himself is an apologist for that he said it didn't create any jobs and he says you know out of the 14 sectors not all of them will do well i mean the amount of money they spent in such schemes creating in the formal sector itself not so even to go there in the informal sector the kind of inequity and dualities that exist in the informal sector in a one scheme itself has led to an absolute disaster in the way your employment strategy has been managed you don't even have an employment strategy right um you, you uh, manufacturing is absolutely dead foreign investments are not coming into india for of the prime ministers outreach all over the world fdis have been the lowest in decades because you've interfered in your bilateral treaties you know there's no uh, process of arbitration you know people don't want to be uh, uh, to come here pli schemes have been that are dependency on uh, exports particularly from china i heard something about china i mean particularly from china it's 100 billion dollars this year alone our imports where is the manufacturing all the jobs are going to vietnam i don't know how it's coming here demand is stepped manufacturing is all all dead your industrial policy is all skewed and yes i agree state governments have to do more just like mn reg we did an urban emrega in rajasthan we are trying to generate what we can in our own states yeah, yes but manrega you know as i'm saying have... manrega alone cannot be a solution i am the, telling you a complete the rural distress crisis but a structure it has to be restructured completely because they've left it in such absolute wreck this uh, the I... idea of employment Uh, that uh, you know, uh, it can has I... to be restructured completely, including the MSMEs. Okay, but but the MSMEs look... need your attention, focus. The informal sector. Look, how much percentage of your workforce is in the I informal sector? It's about eighty. It's about ninety to ninety-two percent. I mean, I don't have the exact data. They keep varying. But if ninety-three percent of your workforce, of your labour workforce, is in the informal sector, you better do something about it. You okay, can't keep can doing it May in capital-intensive industry. You cannot keep investing. Okay, so you're saying you would reprioritize you. Industry. You would reprioritize much as Professor Arun Kumar seems to suggest. But Sanju Verma, at the end of the day, jobs are created when you kickstart a virtuous cycle of investment. When I look at the numbers, the fact is, over the last ten years, that's been a serious challenge. The fact is, you have not been able to kickstart that virtuous investment, private investment cycle. It hasn't led, therefore, to demand or consumption. The government has not been able to address that. You throw figures at me about how much you've invested in infrastructure. You throw figures at me about the digital economy. You throw figures at me about how many cars we are selling and tractors. We've had a K-shaped recovery. That's the truth of the matter. And the investment cycle has not uniformly grown. That is the reality, Miss Verma. And a reality no, you are not going to confront. A reality, reality. The problem is you live in denial. Rajdeep Sharde Sai, you've called me as the national spokesperson of BJP so that I can share my views. Yes. I'm not here to have a gun to my head and say what you want me to say. I will say what is the hard truth. And no, the hard truth is the investment season. cycle has not kicked off. Can I please finish. Did you even once interject the Congress panelists? Can you let's not make not it again? You know, we are having a very, not, very reasoned debate. Interject. Go ahead. Yes, do not interject, or I will walk out because I will not have you put a gun to my head. I will say what needs to be said. Your audience needs to hear the truth. Yes, please Almost do. No, the truth as you see it. Now, please, I will speak. You listen because I heard everybody without. Heckling anyone? Yes. Now it's my turn to speak. Thank Please you. do and extend that courtesy to me without interjecting. Please. I belong. I think I'm the only one who. This is my black coffee. It's a glass full, because everybody else on this panel seems to be saying that the glass is half empty when it comes to Modi nomics. No, no, and that's I'll not true. And I'll tell you why. 
Let now let me finish, then you can rebut me. Yes. Please don't interject. Yes. I humbly tell you, don't interject. Now, for the benefit of your audience, which is the largest stakeholder in these debates, because everybody on the panel is erudite, they will have their own viewpoints. I do not make assumptions. I will cite data which is in the realm of reality. First point, CMIE says unemployment rate is between 8 to 9 percent. CMIE is a private body owned by the likes of Mahesh Vyas and Ajay Shah, who have in the past been advisors to the Congress for framing their manifestos. So I take what Ajay Shah and Mahesh Vyas say with bucketfuls of salt. Do I believe the NSSO? Yes. Do I believe the PLFS? Yes. What does the PLFS say? It says unemployment rate is at a record low in India at 3.1 percent. PLFS says that the male participation rate is at highest ever at 76 percent. PLFS says that the rural participation rate in terms of labor force participation is at multi-decade highs of 63 percent. My third point to everybody who said, oh, nothing has happened under Modi government. I will just say this numbers never lie. Today, we are a $3.9 trillion economy. It took us 60 years, six decades to touch the first trillion dollar. Under Narendra Modi, we added close to $2 trillion in barely six to seven years. My fourth point, for people who say, Kuch ho hi nahi raha, I will tell you what happened. In 1953, we had Air India, which was nationalized by Nehru. In 1956, we had LIC, which was nationalized by Nehru. In 1969, we had Indian banks, which were nationalized by Indira Gandhi. In 1970 to 73, we had GIC and the coal sector, which was nationalized by Indira Gandhi. Mr. Ayer will corroborate this. In 2013-14, public sector banks were loss-making. Do you know something, Rajdi? I am very proud as an Indian to say that SBI alone last year made profits of 66,000 crore. I am very proud of the fact that All uh, India Limited. One minute now, please, my. No, I am giving you 30 seconds Call because India. I asked you a question yes. on the investment Can cycle. I no, no, ma'am. I am giving you 30 seconds. This is not heckling. I am asking I'm you to address the question. If you would wish to address the question, address it in the next 30 seconds. The investment I'm, I'm, cycle which needs to be kicked off to kickstart growth and then as a result employment. Now can I please finish? Thank yeah, you. 30 seconds. Uh, yes, I will take 30 seconds but provided you don't interject. Now let me tell you about, uh, you know, one very important thing. People who say, people who cannot pronounce investment cycle give gyan to Modi government on Modinomics and investment cycle. Without an investment cycle, without the multiplier effect, which Keen spoke about, you know, how is it possible that in India today is the world's fourth largest automobile producing country, the world's second largest two-wheeler manufacturer, the world's second largest steel manufacturing country, the world's third largest energy producer, the world's second, third or fourth largest solar, wind and hydro power producers, and let me tell you one more thing. For every car that is produced globally, do you know something? There are at least three parts which are assembled or manufactured in India. We are the world's second largest smartphone market. Ma and you say... Ma'am, your, your 30 seconds are up. You've again told me why the glass is half full and we should Modinomics not see it as half empty. Okay, your uh, voice is to come down. Uh, Ma'am, your Where time is up. You, are, you can't take others' time now. Uh, Professor, Arun, Professor Arun Kumar, you know, the... I don't think anyone said nothing has happened in the last 10 years. I think Sanju Verma is being economical with the truth. No one has said nothing has happened. But Professor Arun Kumar, some of the figures again that Sanju Verma throws at, 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 at the viewers are not untrue, particularly the automobile sector. So there are those who believe this is a K-shaped recovery. Some sectors are expanding faster, creating uh, uh, jobs as well. Others have lagged behind. And inequality seems to be the central issue, which I want to end today's debate with and get all of you on that. The inequality index of this country, where 1% of this country's population is such that it will completely control the assets amounting to, uh, to more than 60% uh, of the, you know, in the inequality index, the top 1% income and wealth shares uh, at, uh, at about 40.1%, uh, which is among the highest in the world. How do you reduce inequality? Uh, so, Rajdeep, you're absolutely right. Inequality in India is very large, and the data that comes from various sources only is based on white economy and largely from, you know, the stock market valuations. 
Uh, if you look at the uh, actually black economy, then the inequality would be even larger. Now, what is the implication of that? The implication of that is that the demand is skewed uh, in favor of the well-off segments, and the demand from the uh, poorer segments, that is very low. And that's why the consumption share of GDP is actually falling. The rate of growth of consumption is much smaller than the rate of growth of GDP. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean? What it means is that the capacity utilization in the organized sector is not very high. RBI data shows that capacity utilization has been hovering between 70% and 75%. Now, at that low capacity utilization, obviously, investment would not be very buoyant. And that's why you saw even before the pandemic that the official rate of growth of the economy dropped from 8% to 3.1% in the quarter just before the pandemic. So what it shows is that unless demand is more buoyant, the rate of growth will not pick up, investment will not pick up, capacity utilization will not go up, and therefore the economy will suffer. Now here I just want to point one factor. If the private investment that the finance minister keeps talking about, that the private investment has to increase. The private investment is not increasing because of the demand issue. The demand in the economy is short, and that's why the, the investment rate is low. The problem also is that government cannot solve the problem of, uh, you know, creating jobs because, you know, the government employs about 20 million out of 600 million. So even if you can increase it by 5 million, it is not going to solve the problem because in my estimate, about 24 million young people are ready to enter the job market every year, whereas what we provide in the organized sector jobs are only half a million. So the rest have to go into the unorganized sector. Mm -hmm. And that is where the problem is that if the, <clears throat> the unorganized sector is declining, then you'll have a problem of employment generation. That's why you see lakhs and lakhs of youth applying for a few jobs. Right. You know, uh, uh, Mani Sabarwal, you've heard these figures that Professor Kumar throws out. And those figures are equally valid. 24 million people entering the job market every year. The so-called demographic dividend in some parts, at least, could well be turning into a demographic disaster. I mean, one of the things that you do notice across this country is the large number of youth struggling for employment. Now, whether they're employable, is that the challenge, raising skills, or is that simply expanding the economy, according to you, which is the real challenge? I mean, first of all, let's not think about inequality versus mass prosperity, right? If you threw the five richest people in India into the Indian Ocean, the inequality of India would come down, but I'm not sure it would help the poor. So I think let's stay the course. You know, 50% of India's foreign direct investment since 1947 has come in the last six years. India is getting a lot more attention on the global um, investments, our our own entrepreneurial energies are getting ignited. So I think that beyond a certain point... But the numbers point, you know, are the still not showing private investment say... picking up, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sabarwal. They are not showing it. Yes, but the 50% of India's foreign direct investment since 1947 has come in the last six years. So I think that this cycle which has begun is has roots in the realization of the world that our demographics... We're probably the only country in the world with... Big country with 20 years of growth left ahead of us. So I think I would submit that, you know, we exported more software than Saudi Arabia did oil in 21. You know, no, we got $120 billion in remittances. We sold $50 billion. I think that it's a little unfair to, to believe that the informalization or fiscal deficit spending, you know, we get much more from jobs than we get from welfare. We get identity, we get um, purpose, we get network. So, so we have to stay the course on job creation. And I would just submit the worm's eye view of what is the daily life of an employer. If we stay the course, right. India is in a sweet spot globally, demographically, economically, politically, and let's just stay the course. But you know, uh, we have to do more work. Sure. Nobody says the work is finished. You but know, you're saying you've got to stay the course. But, but Shankar, in our, your happened. and my home state of Maharashtra, we've just seen in the last couple of weeks an election coming up. What does the government do? The government says, you know, we will move in the direction of welfareism. The government will call it welfareism. It's a BJP government. If it was an opposition government, you'd call it revdi. But, you know, the kind of incentives and the... The cash handouts that are being offered by the Shinde government in Maharashtra suggest that the government has no solution at the moment, apart from saying, look, we'll throw a little bit of money, we'll give you a stipend here, we'll give you a, 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 a largely Bena benefit there. Well, India's economic policies have always been afflicted with the short-termism of the politicians. You know, there was an EU president who once said that everybody, politicians generally know what needs to be done, but don't know how to get re-elected after they do that. <laughs> so India's politicians have come, up, come across with a shortcut, which basically says that have money, throw it out. So there are about 12 states giving women uh, uh, cash transfers for women. 
uh, 10 crore people are being given Kisan Samman, and I suspect in the current new budget, there will be a top up on that. There are about six states which are topping up the PM Kisan Nidhi uh, over and above what the center gives. So these are all real factors. The, fa the, the thing is not to get derailed by the volume versus value uh, idea. I mean, you know, I, I like Manish's proposition that 50% of uh, India's total FDI, I don't know whether it's uh, exchange rate, uh, rate adjusted, but it's a very sexy way to put things across. I suspect that once you adjust it for interest uh, interest rates and exchange rates, the picture might look different. Let's not get derailed by the value versus volume proposition, as he said, that the mass uh, prosperity should not be uh, an over and arching goal. What should be our goal is individual prosperity. How will the individual prosper? And what do we need to do? Now, what do we um, do for 24 million Indians coming into the job market every year? Well, Vajdeep, uh, demography is not destiny. I mean, no, uh, the whole story of demographic change is a bit like the poultry economy, if I may say so. I mean, you know, you might have X number of hens, but they need to lay eggs and the eggs have to hatch into chickens and you must find a market for them. Similarly, if you have, I don't think the number is 24 million. I think the number is somewhere near 8 to 10 million. Nobody knows because we don't oh, have a census. Those are, those are conflicting figures. Arun yeah. Kumar is putting 24 million. Dr. Kumar, yeah, yeah. you want so, to source so I it? Don't want, what's your source? I don't want, Dr. Kumar, when you say 24 yeah. million are entering the job market, what's the source? You know, I, I have counted for 2022 the number of people who crossed the age of 15, who crossed the age of 17, and came to the market, crossed the age of 19 after education. So the number came to 27 million. I reduced it by 25% for women who cannot work for the social reasons. Then the number came to 24 okay. million. Okay, you've so given me... an estimation that I put out in the Hindu, which I had already put okay. out elsewhere. Let, let me let me leave it there. I, my producer says we've Can run I quickly complete... come in for 10 no, seconds? No, Sanju Varma, you have... You, I know you need your 10 seconds. Chalo, I'll give you, I'll give you an Anshul Abjit on the stopwatch, 15 seconds each. Let me see if politicians can stick to time. Anshul, you first. 15 seconds. If there was one silver bullet that you believe existed, there isn't, obviously, but where would you start? Give me 15 seconds on the stopwatch. Well, one direct thing in the budget coming up, you know, real wages have actually decreased and agricultural wages of agricultural rivers have actually gone in the negative. So to uh, help in that, you know, 400 rupees daily wages, make it a national uh, okay. scheme right here, right now. As we this believe is one that the PM is likely to, to of course, some of I'll the top up the PM, PM Kisan Samman Yojana, but 15 seconds to you, Sanju Varma, and on the clock now. I'm counting, your time starts now. I think irrespective of whether you hate Modi or you love Modi, you cannot deny the fact that India has had a phenomenal V-shaped recovery our average GDP growth of the last three years is 8.36%. We grew last financial year at 8.2% when the world is struggling to grow at okay. even 2%. And our average inflation is only 5.1%. Your 15 Kudos seconds are up, ma'am. You've uh, stuck Kudos to time. Whether it's a V-shaped or a K-shaped re recovery, it's not about alphabets. It's, it's about human beings out there and whether we can provide them the kind of quality, employable jobs that they need. It is India's big challenge. It is this government or indeed any government's big challenge at the moment. To all my guests for joining me and illuminating us with all your facts and all your analysis.